Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool, and in this video I want to talk about sensor size and how that might affect some of your camera buying decisions. One of the most commonly asked questions I get asked is, can I use X camera? Now I covered a little bit of that in my last video when I was talking about real estate photography and cameras that might be best suited for that. Here though it's more of a broad uh, look at the different camera sensors that could affect your buying choices. So for instance, if you're using a crop sensor camera, if you're thinking Thinking about maybe a micro four thirds obviously then the full frame is something I'm going to cover by taking a look at those three we can see also by what type of work you may be wanting to do if one might be better than the other one of the things I like to do is use full frame for a lot of my work but it isn't always necessary for everything so I wanted to qualify that by showing you some of the science behind the sensors what that actually means and why some new cameras with full frame have a lower megapixel count, but they have different features with them that then create a different quality product. So by digging into this, I wanted to give you a more broad view so you can decide what camera may be best for you based on the sensor size. You ready to take a look at this? Let's get started. So just real quick, if you're not familiar with the difference between full frame, cropped, which is also known as APS-C, and the micro four thirds or MFT, just a little quick diagram on that. And those are just the three sizes I'm gonna be covering here. There's many other sizes, but these are the three common ones you'll come across when you're looking to buy a camera, and then you'll see what type of sensor it has. So the full frame, also known as the 35 millimeter equivalent, tends to be about 36 millimeters by 24. The crop then is smaller at 24 by 16 and then the micro four thirds 17 by 13 so you can see there's a big difference in size and what that really means then is a lot of people think well it's just the width I just need to use a different lens and that is true so here on the bottom I'm showing what you would use if for instance you were doing video and you use I love to use the uh, the Liowa 0d 12 millimeter lens the f2.8 and so I've showed the equivalent here they have all three of those types so if you were doing video on a full frame using that lens you would use the 12 millimeter lens and you would get a 12 millimeter focal length. If you were using the crop sensor camera though, that crop factor means you have to then multiply that size by 1.5. So you're taking a look at a nine millimeter lens, which would then give you a 13.5 millimeter equivalent if you were using a full frame. And then when you're at the micro four thirds, it's about half the size. So it's a crop factor of two. So using a 7.5 millimeter micro four thirds lens is a equivalent to using a 15 millimeter full frame. So let's now look at what we really are talking about when it's sensor size. So let's take a look as this example, let's just say this is a full frame sensor. All these little blocks then are what are known as the photo sites, or also like a lot of times people just refer to this as pixels. So each photo site, each little block that I drew on here is what gathers the light. So when you, uh, when the shutter opens on your camera, then each one of these is activated and they're gathering light. So they're just an electronic sensor uh, uh, that's gathering the information that will then be sent into your camera for processing. So this is where we talk about megapixels where it's like, well, how many pixels on the X and Y axis? Multiply that and then you have how many millions of pixels? That's all great. And you can do the same thing on an APS-C size sensor, a cropped one, but then it's gonna be smaller. So when we take a look at the APS-C uh, sensor, same number of sensors on it, but each one of those sensor sites becomes smaller. So there's less area on each pixel, each photo site, to gather all the light information. Now that includes uh, how much light, how much shadow uh, contrasted to that, and then of course the various colors that it also is gathering. So if we take a look though, if we were to go back to full frame and all of a sudden increase the size of each photo site, we'd have fewer photo sites, so our megapixel count would be lower, but with the photo sites bigger, there's more area on each each photo site to gather more light, have a better contrast than the shadows, and gather more information for the various color that it has to work with. 
So let's take a look at a table of some sensors from just a few cameras. Now, the uh, Nikon D610, you know, is one of my favorites. It's an older camera, I know, but just like I showed in my last video, this is still in production by Nikon because it's a really good camera and it's very inexpensive. You get them renewed for less than $800. So uh, taking a look at that compared to the Sony a7 III, which is a full frame, the Sony a6600, which is cropped, and then the new Sony a7S III full frame, and then a couple of micro four thirds by Panasonic to GH5 and GH5S. So we can see, just taking a look at uh, the megapixels by the pixel size, that's the last column there, and that's measured in square micrometers. So uh, the pixel size, width micrometers, height micrometer, anyways, it's squared. So anyways, that's just the pixel size, tells us how big each one of those photo sites are. So when we t compare, for instance, the uh, D610, the Nikon, to the Sony a7 III, they're pretty much about the same when it comes to megapixels and pixel size. They're full frame cameras and they have the same megapixel count. You would expect each photo site to be about the same size. Notice though, when we go down and compare the Sony a7 III to the Sony uh, a6600, they both have 24 megapixels, but with the a7 III being a full frame, the pixel size is more than twice as large as what you'd have on the uh, crop sensor version, the A6600. This is why the A7 III, it does cost more. It's gonna excel in a lot of other areas and I'll touch on that just shortly. Interestingly though, now let's compare the A7 III to the A7S III and both are full frame cameras, but the megapixels are cut in half on the A7S III. This is because they're making this camera geared toward video big time. You can tell that by the pixel size. So look at that pixel size. It's more than twice of what you'd have from the uh, the Sony a7 III. So that allows you to gather a lot more information, but you're not gonna have as large of a print. But when we get to video, and I'll show some of that here shortly also, then this really excels. So that really makes a big difference in sensor size. Uh, We've got the same sensor size, megapixels cut in half, we have a bigger pixel size. When we get into the micro four thirds, we can see that the pixel size really drops off. If we were to try to use something that would be equivalent to around the 24 megapixel range. So the GH5 has uh, 20 megapixels. That's good, you can think that's really getting close to what I'm getting off of uh, the uh, crop sensor or the full frame at 24 but it only has a pixel size of 11 squared micrometers. So it's a very small pixel, so it isn't gonna gather much information. So what Panasonic did was, since a lot of people were using the GH5 for video, they made the GH5S really geared toward video by saying, well, we don't need as many pixels. We can go with about 10 uh, megapixels, and then the pixel size grows very large. So the megapixel size then is greater than what you'd have, for instance, on a Sony uh, A6600. It's not gonna be the same as what you'd get out of the A7 III or even the, the, uh, the Nikon uh, D610, but it does increase it quite a bit. So once again, the pixel size here is what can bring in more quality, but we're gonna sacrifice the number of pixels that we have. So now we start weighing the differences between if we wanted to use this more for video, if we wanted to use this more for stills, or how large the stills would be, the quality expectations expectations out of them as well. So let's take a look just at the first three, just so we get a really good picture. Drive this home just a little bit, once again, on the megapixels versus pixel size. And let's take a look at the first three. There was the Nikon D610, the A7 III, and the A6600. All are about 24.2 megapixels. That's that uh, blue column. And we can see that the first two, the 610 and the A7 III, have about the same pixel size. But even though the A6600 has 24 megapixels also, the sensor size is so much smaller. You can see there's just so much less of area to gather light, have the contrast of shadows, and then work with color. Now let's take a look at all those cameras I just listed, and you can see that the A7S III has a massive pixel size. It has one of the smallest uh, megapixel count, 
but it excels really high. And that's where this comes into like, do I need pixel size more than I need megapixels? And this is one of the big decisions then that comes across. And of course, price has a lot to do with this too when you weigh this against it. For instance, you could think that, well, I could get a Sony a6600, but if you're gonna be doing a lot of video more than stills, then the GH5S may be the best alternative compared to the 6600. Now, there's a lot of cameras out there. This isn't all of them. These are just some examples to show you the size. So now, let's actually take a look at what this means when you test it. So dxomark.com, I love using this to compare different cameras, different lenses. This shows the uh, Sony uh, A6000 compared to the uh, Panasonic D, uh, the GH5, and then the Sony A7 III. So this gives you an idea based off of the size of the sensor. So the yellow line being the A7 III, well, that's a full frame. When we get down to the orange line, the A6000, that's a uh, crop sensor. And then the Panasonic Lumix GH5, that would be your typical micro four thirds. And you can see there is a difference that you are gonna get a better signal to noise ratio when you do go full frame. Th these graphs are just common. You you can compare almost any full frame camera to any uh, APS-C or Micro Four Thirds cropped camera and you'll see similar results. So this is just nature of the beast when it comes to full frame cameras. That's where you get tend to get the higher quality. People wonder why. It's not the megapixels. A lot of time that better quality is coming out of the sensor's pixel size. So let's take a look though at an uh, interesting uh, graph here with the Sony a7 III compared to the a7S III. Now, the a7S though had much larger pixel size. We would expect the a7S III to immediately excel in dynamic range because it's gathering so much more information, right, than the a7 III. But in this case, we can only see that that started happening once we passed ISO 800. Now, there's been talk, uh, people call it the, uh, the dual ISO that Sony has. Sony doesn't list that. They say they don't have such a thing. But instead, what they're able to do is they have algorithms that will take into account the ISO range and other information that's coming off the sensor. And you can see they do a really good job of that once they get into the ISO 800 range by having a better dynamic range. You're able to pull more information off that sensor. Now, I'll bet you dollars to donuts that that sensor is gathering a lot more information and tweaking the algorithms over time. They'll even make the A7S III better in future firmware releases. But anyways, this was an interesting one and also that whole dual ISO thing. I can touch on that. If you'd like to have another video on that and dig into it, just let me know in the comments. So another thing to look at here is the uh, the pixels used. And this is what I was talking about, the difference between when you think about video compared to stills and how big your stills may be. Now, if you're using a full frame camera, that's the bar here on the left, then you're talking about 6,000 pixels wide out of a 24 megapixel camera. But when you're doing video with that same camera and you're only shooting, shooting 1080, which I know today it's 4K, 8K, everything like that, for a lot of real estate video, those are a little bit overkill for processing time and whatnot. But let's say that you're doing 1080, okay? And I also show 4K, but the 1080 is using such a small amount of pixels, it's only 19, 20 pixels wide. When we go to 4K, that's when you're up closer to about 4,000 pixels wide. So it's gonna be using more, but still, it's not using all of those pixels and photo sites on the camera sensor. So you don't need all those pixels on there. You don't need all the megapixels if you're doing video, but sensor size really comes into play. And that's why sometimes for video, you don't need the megapixel so much as you, the high count of megapixels as you do need the larger size for those uh, photo sites on the sensor itself. So let's say that you're doing primarily like I do real estate photography. I also do uh, architectural photography, do portrait work. And with that, especially knowing that some of my stuff's going into print magazines and might even go on billboards, that it's important for me to use full frame. It also makes it easier for me to do the post-processing. I know based off of using the full frame with those larger photo sites, those larger pixels on the sensor, I'm getting a better dynamic range. I have a lot more flexibility 
flexibility in post-processing what I can do with that. So a different quality and quite honestly the full frame cameras are not that much more nowadays compared to a crop sensor camera. But let's talk about video for a second. So with some of those uh, micro four thirds cameras, those sensors, you can get sometimes a better quality video. So you don't have to, you're not going to be using all the pixels that are on the, uh, the sensor of a full frame camera, for instance, when you're recording your video. So although a full frame camera for stills does a fantastic job at and maybe excelling in a lot of areas compared to using a micro four thirds or a crop sensor camera, when it comes to video, a lot of that really does depend on the photo, sots, photo site size. So the size of the pixels that are being used. And then of course, how those pixels are uh, the quality of them on the sensor and then how the camera itself is using that in its algorithm. So you might want to think that, well, I've got one camera, I can do it all. You might want to rethink some of that. If you're doing primarily video, then you want something that's more lightweight. So a lot of the micro four thirds cameras tend to be very, they're smaller. They tend to be very lightweight. Same with the crop sensor cameras. If they have large photo sites, if they have large pixels on them, then more than likely you're going to get a very good quality video out of that camera. If you're doing primarily stills, then you're probably going to want to gear towards the full frame arena. Once again, so you get a better quality product out of using those larger photo sites, those larger pixels that are on the sensor, giving you better dynamic range, uh, lower to signal to noise ratio. So just a better quality product overall. So that's a uh, kind of an, a large overview based on especially my realm of doing real estate photography. If you need something lightweight and you're doing like street photography, you're doing weddings, you're on the go, you're doing journalism, then that's where you have to find that balance where real estate photography, doing a lot of the still work, cameras are on a tripod. doesn't matter the weight so much of it. If you're uh, doing video, you need something very light because you've got a gimbal that you're holding around and it'll definitely give you a workout. And if you're doing street photography, if you're doing a lot of uh, landscape photography on the go, you're not using a tripod, weddings, stuff like that, then that's where you have to start weighing the odds. Is a camera good enough? If it's going to be a crop sensor camera, does it have a good enough quality coming out of those pixels and the pixel size on there? So you can check a lot of these things at dxomark.com like I did here, and that'll give you a pretty good idea. They don't test every camera, but they do cover quite a bit. And hopefully this video has been helpful to try to give you that insight on the various buying decisions based off sensor size. If you did like this video, if you want to see more like this, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.